As we worship God, we are spiritually refreshed. And as we are spiritually refreshed, we tend to feel better physically. And as we feel better physically, our whole life feels better. So God has a plan in his wisdom for us to first and foremost worship him in spirit and in truth, at the same time has so designed it that we might be able to benefit ourselves. During the preaching time in the last, actually for two years, since March of 20, we've been choosing and preparing subjects that would be beneficial to us during the times in which we live. And they have tended to change a little bit, although much has remained the same. This morning is no exception to that principle. The supply of our needs. Another subject to help us in the time in which we live. We have needs. Our needs need to be supplied. Now when you stop and think about that and it, it occurs to you, you've had those needs since the day of your birth. You've had needs that need, needed to be supplied and you will have them until the day you die. You will have needs that need to be supplied, provided for. And so when we look at this principle, we look at our lives today, we understand there is much said about our needs, the supply of our needs, but in our day, it's difficult to think about this without reflecting upon what we hear so much about under the expression, as you see on this chart, supply chain. Years ago, we never thought about this. In recent times, we've heard so much about it on the news, so many concerns about it, we hear so much. It's a part of everyone's vocabulary, at least to some extent, but why? Well, there have been problems with the supply chain. Some problems when you go to the store, the shelves are bare, uh, what, what you need to buy for your provision is not available. Now that may not be so much true of some things anymore, but it's still very true of a lot of things. I was just learning yesterday how it continues to be true for the baby formula. We may tend to think, well, that has gone away, but actually, in fact, when you get the data in front of you, it's just as bad or worse than it ever has been. Can find formula to feed babies, at least readily available. So when you look at this supply chain chart, we realize it's a very complicated thing. When you stop and give thought to it, and there's a lot available today to read, to think about what it takes to get something from the point of manufacture or growth, if it be in the field, in a foreign country, if that be the case, to your home, to your table, is a very complicated situation. And when any part of that fails, there is a breakdown in the supply to you and to your needs. So we all remember seeing those pictures of those ships carrying those freight containers sitting in hold patterns in the bays in San Francisco and Los Angeles and Miami and Savannah and other places and still true to some extent because the supply chain, for one reason or another, has problems. So what that does is make it difficult for us to get the things that we need. So there's manufacturing or growing, there is transportation, uh, there is storage in warehouses, uh, there is the freight to the retail outlet, Kroger's, Lowe's, Walmart, wherever it is that we go to buy what we need, the supply oftentimes is not there. There's a lot of problems with getting people to work. There's problems with getting people to participate with 
the cost of fuel, the cost of energy with uh, uh, inflation taking everything higher to get the supply to you. So it's a, it's a very complicated thing. But let me ask you, all of that that we're very much aware of, how much confidence do you have in that process, in the supply chain to get the supply of your needs to you? Well, when we think about that, there's a lot to think about, but I would say I'm not going to talk about those physical things that you see on this chart. They're a part of what we're going to be talking about, but they're not the main part. The ma main part is another supply chain that we all have, and that supply chain is, is one that we would say a part of the supply of our needs that never fails, never fails. And so when we think about it, we understand that's a part of what we are to have faith and confidence in as Christians. So our confidence in the supply of our needs, if people look at only what was in that picture, there may be some lacking of confidence. Uh, I'm just not sure anymore. Uh, and there are still some things we go to the store and want to buy. I've been waiting a month <laughs> for a shelf to have something in it for a product that we need at home. It's not there. So there are still some shortages. So how much confidence do I have? Well, it all depends on my understanding and my keeping in perspective, and you're doing the same, of the supply chain that we have that never fails. And so when we think about this, I'd like to read a passage of Scripture in which the Apostle Paul has brought this subject to our attention. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, he has been talking about how they, the church at Philippi, supplied his needs through Epaphroditus. He brought to the Roman imprisonment the things that Paul needed. His needs were supplied by Philippi. And what he does is turn that around and show them to what benefit that was to them. And my God, he said, shall supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I would suggest to you that's a powerful statement for the times in which we live. For keeping in perspective the things that we need to being supplied in this life for what is needed for our life, for our needs and other things. And so when we take a look at what Paul has said in this passage, I want to bring some things to our attention that hopefully we can come together on in our minds and hearts in this worship service today in a way that will be benefited and we can leave this worship with gospel preaching part of our worship as edifying in a very significant element. And when you think about it, if you, if you have needs from the day of your birth till the day of your death that need to be supplied, I suggest to you what you already realize, the supply of those needs is hugely important to you. Sometimes we take them for granted. We never think about that. It just happens, doesn't it? It's just there without explanation. But we know that's not the case. So let's take a look at some things. Think about some things spiritually that will help build our confidence in the supply of our needs, even in that supply chain that involves ships, trucks, planes, trains, and all of those kinds of things. It stands as a promise. Anytime God promises you something, you're promised something in Scripture, you can have confidence in that. Now, whether you do or not, and the degree of your confidence is depending upon the strength of your faith. How much do I believe that? How much can I accept of that? Well, let's mark it down first, that what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19 is a promise. He made that to the Philippians. It's made in Scripture to all of us. And we understand that what he said in that passage affects the supply of every need that we have. He said, and my God will supply every, every need of yours. And so it, it's an everyday thing. It's an everyday promise. 
that is made. It's a matter of faith and trust in God, not in ships, trucks, trains, planes, but in God. And so as we think about that, then what we need to do is return to God what he expects us to do, and that is to express our thanksgiving unto him. Not worry, not concern, not stressed out or frustration because we can't get what we want today because the shelf is empty today. Let's have a bigger picture of things. And the bigger picture of that is having faith and confidence and trust in God and offering him thanks. The Apostle Paul said in this passage, he wrote this in the context of writing to Timothy concerning an apostasy that would occur during this Christian dispensation. This apostasy would involve men who would be seduced with false doctrine, who would have uh, the uh, forbidding to marry, forbidding certain dietary items as a part of, and Paul is making the statement, that's not true. This is not true. Every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified through the word of God and prayer. Now, place importance, if you will, on thanksgiving. We, we, we do that. We know we ought to do that, and sometimes we're even negligent of that. But what Paul said in this passage, God provides everything and every creature he has provided for our good. And verse uh, 4 uh, emphasizes that as well. The things that he has provided for us, for our food, for our physical sustenance, he intended to be good. Nothing is to be rejected. We may not have a taste for everything. That's a different matter. But what he is saying, nothing is to be rejected for your righteousness. Nothing is to be rejected so that you can have a better chance of going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. God provides everything in order that we might be able to be sustained. And what we are to do, it is to be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified, it is set apart, it is made holy through the word of God and prayer. And so it stands as a promise. And if we know anything about the promises of God, he will never, never fail keeping his promise. The supply of our needs, according to God's supply chain, provides our spiritual needs. Now, we didn't see that in the picture with the ship, did we? Or the trucks, or the airplane or the whatever else was in the picture. But God's supply chain provides for our spiritual needs. Oh, we, we sometimes don't think about having spiritual needs and they need to be supplied. And isn't that more important or most important? Well, let's notice some things that are stated in the New Testament that you can mark down Take home, reread, and study, and build your faith upon. Paul, the Hebrew writer, said in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, Let us, therefore, draw near with boldness unto the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help us in time of need. This verse is addressed specifically to people of God who have a time of need, who have needs that need help, need supplied. And what is being said in time of need, we are being taught in this verse to draw near to God with confidence that we'll receive his help, that he will provide that help, that we can receive that help. And we have a supply for our needs from the what he called in this passage, the throne of grace. Every time we go to God in prayer, if we go to God in prayer as we should, we're approaching and bowing before a throne that God is sitting upon, that Christ is at his right hand. But in this passage, it's called the throne of grace. Why do you think it's called that? Well, obviously, it's explained in this passage that we may receive mercy, that God will have pity upon us. He will have sympathy upon us, and he will help us. But verse 14, as we've indicated in that point, 
uh, indicates that this is all through the high priest that we have in heaven who has ascended there to be at the right hand of God, who has been tempted in all points like as we have, yet without sin, in a position that he can help us and will help us as our high priest through the throne of grace. The Apostle Peter wrote a passage that is also helpful. This is in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. He said, seeing that his, that is God's divine power, has granted unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. Now, this is at the beginning of 2 Peter. But what Peter's talking about here, God granting, uh, that, that means uh, provided or as supplied is, is another synonym. So what he's talking about, seeing that his divine power has supplied or provided unto us, what? Everything needed spiritually. It's contained in the expression, seeing that his divine power hath granted unto us, underline, all things, everything. Nothing excluded, nothing left out, nothing forgotten, nothing omitted. And this indicates to us that God's supply for our spiritual needs is all sufficient. A lot of people, uh, and as we talked about, and we'll bring that in here next, but uh, don't look to God's help. I think it's outdated, antiquated, and that we need additional writings, even writings of men that provide more modern instruction, more updated help. So I need that to make me equipped spiritually for life today. No, you don't. Mark it down that every spiritual need that you have to go to heaven has been given, supplied by God and his divine power. It is all sufficient. It is all that you need. There's nothing else that is needed. If you go to heaven, it will be because you have assessed to you and to your life all things that God has provided for your spiritual life and your godliness. Now, that might leave some questions. It really probably doesn't, but let's underline something. Because the Apostle Peter explains how that works. How does God do that? What is your part in God doing that? God's divine power has provided and supplied, but he's already mentioned this in verse 2, but through, his, through the knowledge of him that called us by his own glory and virtue. I'm going to do something today that I did last week and bring the weeks before sermon into last week's sermon. I'm going to bring last week's into the today's sermon. You know what that's teaching us? It's teaching us the only way that you can have that supply is through the Word of God and knowledge of that Word. And that's why the Bible still matters. Another reason that we can think of that we can have wrap our hearts and minds around and accept and know the Bible still matters because it is God's supply chain for my spiritual needs and in that word everything that I need for spiritual life and godliness in this life to go to heaven is in that word of God. For us of course the law of authority that guides us in matters of faith and doctrine is the New Testament the new covenant of Christ. But the Bible still matters because it is a part of God's supply chain for you. If you lay it down, leave it lay, let it collect dust, that's like leaving the ship at port with all those storage boxes on. Just let it stay out there. No, no, we need that stuff. <laughs> Linda and I were, it's been before all this came to news, we were shopping at Lowe's because we needed an appliance and they had a sales thing, and so we went in there, that's the one we want because it was on sale and it's the one we needed. Well, we don't have that one in stock. Oh, you don't have that one, but it's in the advertisement. Well, we intended to have the shipment, and our last word, you know where it was? 
sitting on a ship in the bay west of California, waiting to get that stuff unloaded. And this has been before this crisis even came to our attention in the news. This has been happening for some time. And so we look at matters, but look at the Bible. Sometimes we teach the Bible that way. Leave it lay. Don't worry about it. It's there. It's good to look at. I, th I have some good, friendly thoughts about it. But it's God's supply chain to you. You can't have what God is supplying to you without it unless you open it and read it. And so take that matter to heart and understand that God supplies our spiritual needs through his supply chain that will never, never fail. But now I said, well, wait a minute now. What about our physical needs? These passages have dealt with spiritual life and godliness. But does God's supply chain provide for us physical needs? Well, that's a good question. Sometimes we're kind of uh, unclear about that. Sometimes we're kind of fuzzy in our thinking about that. And we're not quite sure exactly whether that's true or not. Maybe that's why we don't have the confidence that we need. So let's try to look at this in Scripture for just a moment. To do that, I'm going to direct your attention to a passage of Scripture in which the Apostle Paul helps us understand this. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Beginning at verse 6, we're not going to take time this morning to read this entire passage. I suggest to you, if you do not have recent reading of this passage or memory of what's in it, it has to do with our giving. Paul is reminding the Corinthians some principles that he taught them concerning the giving into this fund that he was collecting for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And so he said in verse 6, This I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So that, that's a basic principle concerning our money, concerning the coin, concerning our finances. And that is, reaping is in proportion to sowing. And reaping or getting back, being blessed, is in proportion to what we put in or what we sow. Now that being true, uh, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> takes us into a, a, another uh, level in verses 8 and 9 and teaches that God is able to do this. God is able to make us sufficient in everything needed for good works. If we want to do good works and we give part of our money to help the poor, to help the orphans and the widows, uh, James 1, 27, we want to show mercy, uh, James chapter 2, and so like we're taught, then, uh, but, but I can't afford it. Well, okay, but let's rethink that a little bit and see what God is promising concerning his doing of our physical needs. Our physical needs are fulfilled, he said, in proportion to what you do in sowing what you've got. And so God is able, as stated in this passage, but I'd like also one other principle from this passage. If we sow, God will supply and multiply our seed for sowing. And, and that means what it says. Now, now let's, let's look at a, a quote of verse 10. This is such a beautiful passage, specific statement, addressing the question before us. God's supply chain for our physical needs. What is it, Paul? He that supplieth seed to the sower and bread for food. There, that, I mean, that's that food on the table. <laughs> that's what that's talking about. God supplies that. And, and that's why we offer our thanks and say our prayers, offering thanksgiving unto God for his blessing us. But he that supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Now, now notice. 
shall supply and multiply. It's not just a supply, it's a multiply as well. It's not just give you back, but it's to multiply it. So do we know how that works? Has that worked in your life? We need to observe that. We need to have faith and trust in that. We need to know how God works so that God can work in our life and to our benefit in these times when there's a lot of things causing us to doubt and stress out over things that we don't have and can't seem to get and, and so many things. But let's back away and look at the big picture before we get worried about the small detail. The big picture is that God supplies and multiplies our physical blessings, our physical needs, the fulfillment of our physical needs as we use ourselves as his children in sowing that might be needed for good works. Well, there, there's another passage. We could talk about that in 2 Corinthians more. It has to do with our giving. That's where he said, God loveth a cheerful giver. It's, it's stated in, in those verses. But I want to have time to look at what the Lord taught. Addressing the same question, looking at the same principle, the Lord had a lot to say about this as well. And the place that we think of is clearest and most powerful presentation of this subject is in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bible in front of you, I would encourage you to have it open to Matthew the 6th chapter. We're not going to read this passage from beginning to end. We're going to notice parts of it that will help us stress the truth, the principle of what the Lord is teaching. But you remember... Uh, in, in verse 24, the Lord ended that verse by saying, you can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve both masters. You can't serve God and money. Okay, that being true, then you have to choose. Which one is really going to be your master? Which one is really going to be your dominant master? Well, in order to show how that works, from verse 25 through the end of the chapter, in verse 25, the Lord said, Therefore I say unto you, if you're reading with me, the 25th verse in Matthew 6, Be not anxious. In other words, don't worry for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, or yet for your body, what you shall put on, the clothing. Don't worry. Don't be anxious, he said if you choose the right master, if you choose God as your master instead of money. If you choose money, then you better worry about it. <laughs> There's a lot of room for worry if money is your master. But if God is your master, the Lord said, don't, don't worry. Don't be anxious. Is not the life more than the food, the body than the raiment? And you know the argument as you read, it, read through that passage, the Lord is simply teaching a principle, and I have some of this observed, as we get down to verse 33. Concerning these things of food, drink, clothing, those basic essentials of life, he said in the last part of verse 33, all these things shall be added unto you. Supplied unto you is the point that the Lord is making. Well, his argument is, if God supplies for his creation, as we call it on this chart, the needs of the natural world, the birds, uh, uh, the clothing, and things of that nature, flowers of the field. If God takes care of the natural world so perfectly, then why would he think, why would we think that he won't take care of us? The, the Lord's argument is, from, from what we can see by our very eyes, of God's supply to the physical natural world and how beautiful it is and can be most of the time, then surely you can see that God will take care of you. And that's what he said in verse 33. He has an expectation, priority. If I take care of you, like I promise, and I do, then I expect you to have me as number one. 
I don't expect me to take care of you and you to have me as number two with money and the physical world being number one. That won't work. And so the Lord said in Matthew 6, 31 and 33, he said again, be not anxious, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or with what shall we clothe ourselves? But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Either we believe that or we don't. We're practicing that or we aren't. The supply chain of God works this way with our physical blessings, with our physical needs. He expects us to have his kingdom and his righteousness as priority, number one. And we had better have that in place in order to understand and receive from God the, the physical needs. I want to have time to look at one other thing here uh, quickly, and that is, if you're like me, most of us need a bit of a uh, more assurance, confidence, we need to have, get over some of this doubt and some of this stress and worry and frustration. So I'm going to go through a series of verses here that are written in the New Testament to help us gain trust in this. If we don't have trust, whatever we've got, it can always be more, it can always be stronger. But starting with what the Lord said in Matthew 6, verse 32, your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. God knows every need that you have. He does, everyone, better than you do. <laughs> and he had said in verse 8 of the same chapter, under the discussion of prayer. Be not therefore like unto them, the Gentiles, or the, actually in this case it's probably the Jews who make the fair showing of public uh, godliness out for the show in prayer. For your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And so rather than, than like the Gentiles, this is where he includes the thought of vain repetition. They, they repeat, 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 repeat vainly because they think that's necessary for, to be heard. And, and, and the Lord said, you may repeat, but it may not be vain. But here's what you need to understand. God knows what you have need of. You bow on your knee and ask God's help through the throne of grace. Ask him to help you with the need that you've got. He knows what that need is even before you went on your knee. So have trust that God will help because God knows. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound unto you that you having all, thing, all sufficiency in everything may abound unto every good work. That's a basic principle, but it's very important. God is able. God can. I can make a promise to you. I'm going to supply everything you need. You say, no, you can't do that. You're right. You can have no assurance or trust in me to do that. I can't. God can. And so that's why we have trust in him, because God is able to supply everything that he has promised. A statement in Acts 13 and verse 18 where the Apostle Paul is preaching this first recorded gospel sermon for him in this uh, uh, Antioch of Pisidia. Uh, he makes this statement as he reviews Old Testament history, as he's going back over the children of Israel and they're wandering in the wilderness. He made this statement, but look what we have underlined, how he referred to God supply of their needs. And for about the time of 40 years, as a nursing father, bear he them in the wilderness. God still relates to you that way. How do you think of God when you pray to him? You think of some authoritarian, hard-nosed kind of person that I don't feel like any... No. You need to think of someone that's... Uh, as some in this audience are, a nurse. That's what God is, except he's God. He's your father, but how does he treat you? 
as a nursing father. That's an interesting term. It's the only place it occurs in Scripture. Paul used it at Antioch to preach this principle to them. We can have confidence and gain trust because God is a nursing father. And then one other. And that is from 3 John verse 2. Sometimes we don't get back to these epistles of John that often, but here is a very important principle regarding this subject. Beloved, as he's writing to Gaius, I pray that in all things thou mayest pr prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. What did John the apostle pray for Gaius? That in all things he would prosper and be in good health. So can we pray for prosperity? Yeah. Can we pray for good health? Yeah. But the last statement in this verse is kind of a qualifying, as thy soul prospers. So we better make sure that our soul is prospering. But what is the point here that we learn from the Apostle John? God prospers us. He makes sure, now we may not see, we may not have the uh, abundance that other people, the rich, the wealthy in the world have who are serving Satan, but we're serving God. We're living our lives as Christians, wanting to go to heaven, and as do so, God prospers us. Well, back to that supply chain. And when we look at that, we should keep it in perspective. I think God uses that providentially uses that to help get that stuff from wherever it's coming from to your table, to your closet, to your cupboard, whatever it may be. So we keep that in perspective and pray unto God and be patient with God. But as we look at the closing thoughts of our lesson this morning, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, I'm going to take the last part of the verse to emphasize an important principle to think about what God has provided according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Salvation of our soul. Scripture that we can read and understand. Daily strength. I can do all things in him that strengtheneth me. The answer to prayer. The hope of heaven sustains me. I have the hope of going to heaven. That is something that God has supplied to me and to you. And so as he does that, we understand it is something that he has supplied according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Finally, on this point, what God has provided as a New Testament plan of salvation. We all need that. We won't go to heaven without that. Uh, we won't go to heaven on some plan of salvation not in Scripture or has been written by man or has been changed, but the New Testament plan of salvation, believing or having faith in Christ, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in Christ, and being baptized for the remission or the washing away by the blood of Christ of our sins. The supply of our needs. It's a big subject. It's a big part of your life. That supply is hugely significant. <laughs> we, we can't get along without the supply for our needs, whatever they may be. So as we sing this invitation song this morning, there may be someone who is subject to the invitation that desires to have help in going to heaven in your relationship to Christ. And we stand ready to assist you. If you'll let us know or anyone at home would like to study further, let us know that we might be of help together as we stand and sing.